Most of us spend our evenings relaxing in front of the television watching our favorite shows, such as sitcoms, dramas, or even cartoons. Some of these shows have excellent and engaging storylines that keep viewers glued to their screens. But fans of some TV series have come up with a few theories of their own that paint these shows in a completely new light, and some of them are beyond strange. Futurama is considered by many people to be one of the greatest sci-fi cartoon series ever created. Produced by the same people who created The Simpsons, it centers around a man, Philip J. Fry, who gets frozen on New Year's Eve of 1999, only to wake up 1,000 years later to a world that he no longer recognizes. The first friend that he makes is a robot named Bender, and as the series continues, they become inseparable. But while Fry does his best to adjust to his new surroundings, Bender is more focused on committing crimes, breaking all the rules, and drinking as much alcohol as he can get his hands on. But there's a theory that Bender wasn't always this way. During the show's pilot, which was aired for the first time in March of 1999, Fry is pursued by Leela, a female cyclops, who intends to implant him with a chip that will label him as a delivery boy for the rest of his life. Unwilling to accept his fate, Fry flees with Bender by his side, but they soon become cornered and the only way out is for Bender to bend the bars in front of a window. Fry suggests this plan, but Bender informs him that he's only able to bend girders, since this is what he was programmed to do. As he walks away, he accidentally breaks a light bulb hanging above his head, resulting in an electric shock. As soon as he recovers a few moments later, he immediately agrees with Fry's plan and they manage to escape. Some fans of the show have suggested that this is the very moment when Bender becomes the misbehaving character that we've all gotten to know so well, and that if this hadn't happened, it would likely have been a much more easygoing character. But then, as the series entered its fourth season, Bender had yet another personality shift. Fans think that this may be the result of an event that takes place during an episode called Love and Rocket, in which Bender starts dating the Planet Express crew's spaceship. At one point, he ends the relationship, sending the ship into a self-destructive depression, and to save the crew, Bender merges his programming with that of the ship. The crew manages to make it out alive just by the skin of their teeth, but some fans believe that Bender felt the effects of this merging forever, as afterward he became more understanding and sensitive in subsequent episodes, though he still carried on with most of his beloved hijinks. In episodes to follow, Bender would often dress up as a female robot to disguise himself, but his conceited nature shone through even then, as he on one occasion disguised himself in this manner so that he could win the Women's Robot Olympics. One can only wonder what Bender would have been like if he'd not received that electric shock, and whether he would have been as lovable of a character as he turned out to be, had he not merged with the company's spaceship. Those who grew up in the 1990s will no doubt remember the iconic sitcom The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which starred a young Will Smith. It was his first big role as an actor, and thanks to the show's massive success, he would go on to have a very prosperous career in Hollywood. The show had a very memorable opening theme, in which Smith raps about how he ended up living in Bel Air. He explains that he was living in West Philadelphia, where he and his friends spent most of their time on the playground, either relaxing or playing basketball. But on one occasion, he got into a physical altercation with some people who were causing trouble in his neighborhood. And when his mother found out about this, she became worried for his safety and decided to send him to Bel Air to live with his wealthy aunt and uncle. He goes on to describe how he hailed a cab, which he describes as rare. And upon arriving in Bel Air, he was stunned by how huge his relative's house was. And from there, he becomes the Prince of Bel Air. He went on to become one of the most popular kids in his new school and entertained audiences with his rebellious attitude which is evidenced by the fact that he's the only student in his school who wears his uniform blazer inside out. This gives him a distinct sense of individuality, a trait that's seen by some of those around him as endearing, while some of the other characters find it to be rather annoying. But this does little to dampen his spirit. While the show hit the mark as far as humor was concerned, it also dealt with more serious issues, such as why Will's father abandoned him when he was still a child one episode that most fans find particularly interesting. While Will quickly adapted to his new surroundings, 
he still on occasion mentioned that he missed his old stomping grounds, and in particular his mother, who was still living back in Philadelphia. But he would see her on occasion, as she often visited him in Bel Air during holidays. But one fan theory has left people floored, as it suggests that all the events in the show took place in the afterlife. The theory centers on the show's opening theme. Rather than being an introduction to Will's new life, it's been suggested that while the altercation that prompted the move really did take place, Will never walked away and never moved to Bel Air. Instead, he ended up in a coma fighting for his life. The lyrics explaining that his mother wanted him to move away are said to actually represent her acceptance that Will wasn't going to pull through and that she had to let him go. The lyrics, quote, I whistled for a cab, and when it came near, the license plate said fresh and it had dice in the mirror. If anything, I could say that this cab was rare, but I thought, forget it, yo homes to Bel Air, is said to describe his final acceptance as he passed away. And the cab that takes him to Bel Air is actually God guiding him to heaven. Not many people remember that Will had a fiance, but after his move, he never spoke to her again. He also never gets married or has any children, which the theory suggests is because he's actually in the afterlife. Where the theory falls flat, though, is during a summer when Will returns to Philadelphia, and he once again comes face to face with the difficult life he lived there. While there, his nephew is born, which all but confirms that he never passed away, and continues to experience the different challenges that life throws before him. It's an interesting theory that makes a lot of sense up until a certain point, but most fans preferred to remember Will as the fun-loving young adult who became a household name during the 1990s. Fans of The Simpsons will be very familiar with the family's dynamic. Marge, the matriarch, serves as the voice of reason most of the time, though she does on occasion get involved with her own particular brand of hijinks. Maggie, the baby, is silent for almost all of the show's duration, and Lisa is seen as the smart one in the family. She's a vegetarian who has a love for music, which is evident from her saxophone playing, and she can often be seen taking part in one kind of activism or another. Then there's Bart, the fun-loving son who spends most of his time in school, wishing that he was outside riding his skateboard, or that he was at home in front of the TV, watching itchy and scratchy cartoons. He struggles academically, but doesn't often let this affect him. Lastly, Homer, the father, is seen as the dunce in the family, Although he works as a safety inspector at a nuclear power plant, he has no idea what any of the machines do, and more often than not, is dull-witted in nature and it lands him in a lot of trouble. While some of the characters in the show are smarter than others, it would be a stretch to call any of them geniuses, since even the smartest of the bunch, a scientist named Professor Frink, manages to come across as a bit of a dunce since most of his inventions tend to fail catastrophically. But there is one theory that goes against this narrative. It suggests that all the members of The Simpsons are actually geniuses, and that they decided to hide this fact from the rest of the town of Springfield in order to keep their lives a little simpler. The theory suggests that the rest of the family became aware that Lisa, the smart one, never made any friends, and that she on occasion falls into a sort of depression while experiencing bouts of anxiety. Since they're all geniuses, they come up with a way to avoid this feeling by pretending to be just as dim-witted as the rest of the town, and no one ever seems to notice. In fact, one episode lends credence to this theory, as it shows Homer being a genius after a crayon, which was lodged in his brain for years, is removed. But as soon as this is done, his friends begin to realize just how much smarter he's become, and they begin to spend less and less time with him, proving that he would be miserable with a higher IQ. In another episode, we see Marge in her younger days, while she's still a student, and we realize that she's actually pretty smart. Added to this is the fact that she was a terrific painter at one point, but decided to give it up when she and Homer started a family. Bart is seen learning Spanish in the amount of time it takes the family to fly to Brazil. And while this may have been the wrong language, he certainly has an aptitude for learning different languages. While this remains just a theory, it fits in perfectly with the show's plot, and it's easy to see why it's become so popular, even if it is just for a bit of fun. The sitcom Frasier remains popular today, despite being aired for the last time in May of 2004. The main character, played by Kelsey Grammer, first appeared in the sitcom Cheers, 
but he then moved away from Boston to become a radio psychiatrist in Seattle. Here, he rekindles his relationship with his brother, Niles, and his father, Martin, or Marty. Martin eventually moves in with Frazier, since his mobility has been affected by an injury to his leg that he sustained while working as a police officer. To help speed up the process of his recovery, Frazier hires a physical therapist named Daphne. And soon, the three are living together in Frazier's high-rise apartment. Niles eventually falls in love with Daphne amid his failing marriage, and as can be imagined, hilarity ensues. While Daphne does her best to assist Martin as much as possible, it soon becomes apparent that her skills as a physiotherapist are somewhat overrated. But Martin decides to keep her on. Most people believe he did this because of Niles' feelings for her, but a fan theory suggests an alternative motive. While there's no doubt that Daphne's stretching and exercise routines help Martin regain some of his mobility, it's been suggested that he refused to let her go because she understands him better than either of his sons do. And since his wife has long since passed away, she serves as a constant companion. When Martin moved in with Frazier, the two were constantly at loggerheads. But as the series developed, Daphne helped smooth over some of the rough areas in their relationship. And the theory further suggests that this helped Frazier become closer with his father, making her an indispensable part of the narrative. The same is true for the relationship between Frazier and his brother Niles. At first, the two bicker about the smallest things, but Daphne seems to provide them with a down-to-earth perspective on life, making both of their lives much simpler. But the theory goes on to suggest that she's also affected their individual lives positively. Before her arrival, Niles was often seen as miserable, but she seemingly turned this outlook on life around with her quirky ways and friendly nature. As for Frazier, she seems to take very little notice of his need for opulence, and before long, he begins to see that there's more to life than keeping up appearances, though he still enjoys indulging in the finer things in life, such as caviar, foreign cheeses, and champagne. Throughout the show, Martin can be seen following the therapy routine that Daphne has designed for him, but on several occasions, we also see him moving much more freely than he's letting on, only to start limping again as soon as someone else enters the room. The theory posits that if Daphne hadn't remained in Frasier and Martin's lives for as long as she did, their relationship would have cracked under the strain of their different lifestyles, and they would have likely become estranged once more. Hence, to ensure that he can stay close to both his sons, he pretends to be far more affected by his injury than he really is, and in doing so, ensures that Daphne remains an integral part of their family. Bikini Atoll is a set of 23 islands located in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean. Between 1946 and 1958, the U.S. government used the site to test 24 nuclear weapons. Some were detonated on the reefs beneath the ocean. Others were tested in the air, while others were detonated just beneath the water's surface. But to do this, people living in the area had to be asked to evacuate, and before the first test began, most of the family heads on the islands agreed. Most of the island's residents temporarily moved to Rongerake Atoll in Keeley Islands, but the U.S. government had to provide them with aid since the living conditions in those areas were awful. They were told that as soon as the testing was over, they would be allowed to return to their homes on the islands, but sadly this wasn't to be. The nuclear tests that had been carried out resulted in massive amounts of radiation lingering in the area, and it remains there today, making it impossible for anyone to live there. The water had become impotable. The soil wouldn't allow for anything to grow. Fishing, which was a massive part of the inhabitants' lives, had now become too dangerous, and they wouldn't ever be able to farm there again. When tests were conducted at the site in 2016, radiation levels were found to be too high for anyone to live there and the U.S. government has been forced to pay out hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation and aid, since they're responsible for the residents' displacement of their homes. That same survey did, however, find that marine life around the islands is still abundant, and this has given rise to a fan theory regarding the popular children's cartoon SpongeBob SquarePants. The first hint that this theory may have some credibility is the name of the town in which SpongeBob and his friends live, Bikini Bottom. Here, he works as a fry cook in the Krusty Krab restaurant, which is owned by the greedy Mr. Krabs. Krabs' enemy is a single plankton who attempts to steal the secret recipe for his burgers every chance he gets. 
There's also SpongeBob's dim-witted best friend, a starfish named Patrick, his neighbor, a snobbish cashier at the Krusty Krab, a squid named Squidward, and a squirrel named Sandy who hails from Texas. These are just a few of the very quirky characters that appear in the show, and a fan theory suggests that they got their strange character traits and behaviors as a result of the nuclear testing that was carried out in the area by the US government. While this may seem a bit far-fetched, some of the show's characters and other staff members have stated that they now believe the theory to be correct, and have even pointed out that some of the characters can sometimes be seen wearing clothing from that period. In an episode titled Dying for Pie, SpongeBob attempts to hand a pie to Squidward, but he trips over a rock, sending the pie flying through the air and into Squidward's face, where it then explodes. The footage then cuts to a live-action scene of an atomic explosion, lending even more truth to the strange theory that SpongeBob and his companions are living in radiation-infested waters. It's also been suggested that the nearby strange and desolate town of Rock Bottom has been left to rot as a nuclear wasteland, resulting in the strange language spoken by the characters that live there. Dexter's Laboratory was one of the most famous Cartoon Network series of the late 90s. During its run between April of 1996 and June of 1998, fans fell in love with his scientific antics and the show's sometimes sci-fi inspired nature, not to mention some of the strange characters that it introduced. Dexter, a boy genius, could be seen hard at work inside of his secret laboratory that he constructed under his family's home. But his parents remain blissfully unaware that he's conducting often dangerous experiments right beneath their noses, despite being baffled by their high energy bill. Only one other member of the family is aware of the existence of the lab, Dexter's sister, Dee Dee. She often inadvertently foils Dexter's plans thanks to her carefree and dim-witted nature. And on more than one occasion, she's responsible for an untold amount of damage that is usually created by her penchant for ballet dancing. But not many people know that Dexter wasn't always meant to be the main character of the show. When its creator was attempting to come up with a new concept for a cartoon, he drew Dee Dee first and only added Dexter as her brother as an afterthought. But when he and a few other artists got together, they decided that Dexter should become the focus of the show, with Dee Dee acting as a constant annoyance in his life, as well as the love interest of his arch enemy, another boy genius named Mandark. And so the show continued to develop with Dexter, showing his mental prowess in every episode, only to have Dee Dee interfere with his latest invention, equipment, or scientific discovery. But on several occasions, Dexter thinks a little too big and he ends up in trouble. Sometimes his reckless experiments put the entire planet in danger, and it's only thanks to Dee Dee's help that he's able to bring things back to normal. Because of this, a few fans have come up with the theory that the real star of the show is actually his sister, and that she's much smarter than she lets on. It's even been suggested that she's smarter than Dexter and she only pretends to be a dunce, so that she'll still be allowed into his lab to keep a close eye on him and his research. It's also been suggested that Dexter is the one lacking in mental capacity, since he often fails to realize just how dangerous his plans could be and that he's endangering the lives of his family and sometimes everyone on Earth while trying to make a name for himself in the scientific community. The theory is further proven by the fact that he sometimes puts his own life in danger merely to address a slight annoyance. In one episode, he tires of constantly having to change his lab uniform and hence decides to laminate himself. Then there's the fact that Dexter does his best to keep Dee Dee out of his lab, but despite his elaborate locks and guardian robots, she still manages to find a way in with very little effort, sometimes appearing as if out of thin air and much to Dexter's frustration. If Dexter really was as smart as he thought he was, it should have been easy for him to find a way to keep Dee Dee out, and hence many fans feel that she's simply allowing him to believe that he's the smarter of the two siblings, when she is actually the genius in the family. When it comes to naming the best and most loved sitcoms of all time, Seinfeld is almost always mentioned as one of the frontrunners. The show saw a massive amount of success during the 1990s, and before long, its main characters had become household names. There was Elaine, comedian Jerry Seinfeld's ex-girlfriend, who works as a copywriter's assistant at Pendant Publishing. George, Seinfeld's best friend, who's always looking for true love, 
while attempting to remain employed for as long as possible. And the wacky Kramer, who lives across the hall and who's constantly eating food from Seinfeld's fridge after letting himself into his apartment. As the show developed, these four characters became inseparable and they often ended up in hilariously awkward situations together, such as getting lost in a multi-story parking lot for an entire day when they're unable to remember where they parked. When they finally find their car later that evening, the engine won't start. While the show is filmed in several different locations, the most familiar is Jerry's apartment. It serves as a kind of headquarters for the main characters, and on occasion, for some of the supporting characters too. During the show's run, each of the characters go through several romantic relationships, which they end up discussing at Jerry's place. In fact, it seemed that they were dating someone new almost every week, and they were constantly in Jerry's apartment, allowing him very little time to himself. But one fan theory has now tried to explain this. It suggests that we as the viewers don't see everything that's going on in the characters' lives, and that there are certain gaps that need to be filled in by the show's audience. Keep in mind that Jerry is a stand-up comedian, and a very successful one at that. Hence, he needs to travel all over the country to earn money, which he has plenty of. While we often hear him talking about catching a taxi to the airport, or see him returning to his apartment with his luggage, this isn't an aspect of the show that's given much screen time. Hence, it's been suggested that his close friends are aware of his touring schedule, and that they don't see him nearly as much as we've been led to believe. When he returns from a tour, his friends are eager to see him, and the best way to do this is to meet him at his apartment. This also explains the strange fact that they're constantly dating new people. Since we don't get to see what happens to the characters while Jerry is away, we're often greeted by a new love interest that's entered the picture in the meantime. This also explains why they always have some tidbit of news to share, and why Jerry is often unaware of what's going on in his friends' lives until they tell him about their latest exploits that happened while he was away. Some fans have added that Jerry may simply have been the most accommodating apartment, or that they're constantly visiting him, since they don't have cell phones at the time. Even though Kramer lives in the same building, and hence should have a similar apartment, he's always over at Jerry's, either raiding the fridge or simply hanging out, sometimes on his own, suggesting that he prefers being there rather than at his own place. Even though it's just a theory, it's fun to think about, and it certainly does explain why Jerry's apartment is always a hub of activity. The hugely popular cartoon, Pinky and the Brain, aired its last episode in 1998, but since then it's become somewhat of a cult classic. Fans of the show first encountered the two lab mice in 1993 as characters of the Animaniacs cartoons, but they proved to be so popular that they received their own spin-off TV show. Brain was portrayed as a genius while his sidekick, Pinky, seemed to know very little about anything and on occasion ended up accidentally thwarting their plans to take over the world an endeavor that they pursued in every single episode with varying amounts of success. In many of the episodes, Brain seemed to become irritated and even infuriated at Pinky's stupidity, but remained friends with him since he didn't have anyone else to help him with his quest for world domination. But try as he might, Brain and Pinky always ended up right back in the cage where they started their plan, only to start a new scheme again the next day. Brain often used elaborate pieces of technology to try and bend the world to his will, giving us the impression that he's some kind of genius lab mouse. But according to a theory about the show, this may not actually be the case. Some fans have suggested that Pinky is actually the brains behind the whole operation, and they've even provided proof of their claims. The theory started thanks to the show's opening theme song. The lyrics are Pinky and the Brain, one is genius, the other's insane and we can instantly see which is which, as Brain is seen expertly and effortlessly picking the lock in their cage and working on mathematical problems while Pinky dances around in a straitjacket. But since the song never explicitly states which of the mice is the genius and which is insane, some fans have suggested that this is actually the other way around. Since Brain's plans always fail, they theorize that he isn't as smart as he thinks he is. Added to this is the fact that his plans are often needlessly elaborate, and that his plans sometimes fail because of his own impatience or unwillingness to listen to his sidekick's advice. This, the theory holds, results in Brain becoming somewhat of a laughingstock in the eyes of the audience. 
Furthermore, Brain isn't the only one who creates plans to take over the world. Pinky has some very bright moments, such as acquiring the keys to every country in the world, which he then gifts to Brain for his birthday. With the means to take over within his hands, Brain then manages to spoil everything thanks to his rude nature, and soon the pair finds themselves back in their cage, ready to start concocting a new strategy. It's also been suggested that Pinky realizes just how smart he is, but decides to hide his intelligence from Brain so that he can focus on having a good time during their adventures, rather than becoming bogged down by their attempts to overthrow mankind. Since both mice were subjected to the same experiments that resulted in them being able to talk, there's no reason for Brain to be any smarter than Pinky, but Pinky seems to care less about attaining power and instead relishes in the simple things in life, which seemingly pass Brain by without his knowledge. Westworld is a dystopian science fiction drama that graced our screens for six years from 2016 to 2022. It featured a massive park known as Westworld, where members of the public could live out several different adventures with the help of artificial life forms known as hosts. The hosts were created to be as lifelike as possible and are touted by their creators as being virtually indistinguishable from normal human beings. They're programmed to play out whichever scenario they're placed in, but they're given a semblance of free will or improvisation to make the experience as realistic as possible. Since they know nothing of the world outside the park, the hosts can often be seen completely ignoring comments made by their guests about the outside world. They aren't even able to identify certain objects that have been brought into the park and when asked about them, usually reply that the item doesn't look like anything. When one of the hosts malfunctions or something unexpected happens in the park, the hosts are told that they're merely dreaming. This happens often while maintenance is being done in the park and ensures that they're able to maintain a sense of continuity among the hosts. While the experiences had by visitors to the park are all simulated, some fans have suggested that this may only be a small part of the actual simulation, which encompasses the rest of the outside world. While those who come to the park for recreational purposes are under the impression that they're stepping into a simulated world for the first time, it's possible that they've been living inside a much larger and more powerful simulation their entire lives, and that they themselves are simulated beings. In fact, some people have gone as far as to suggest that the show might be evidence that we're living in a simulated environment. While the theory that we may be living inside a computer simulation isn't a new one, the addition of the show to that theory is quite interesting. Rather than being artificial, programmed beings that continue to live our lives as normal every day, it posits that we may be part of a massive Westworld-style universe where we serve as entertainment to visitors. This would explain why we've been unable to explore space as easily as we would like, and why we still know so little about our universe, despite conducting centuries worth of research on the planets and stars around us. Furthermore, it would be very easy for our creators to hide the fact that we aren't actually alive. It would be as simple as adding the appropriate programming to our systems, and since we would have little to no free will, we would never feel the urge to find out whether we are, in fact, living, breathing beings. The theory suggests that Earth is a kind of amusement park that's been populated by humans. We go to work, raise our kids, play sports, watch television, and go about our everyday business, unaware that we're being watched by members of alien races who find our antics most amusing. It's said that this would explain sightings of extraterrestrial craft around the world, and the belief held by some that aliens walk among us. They may simply be on holiday and living out one of their own chosen adventures while appearing to us as human, since we're unable to recognize anything that isn't part of our simulated experience. This theory has gained a lot of popularity online, since it's akin to the simulated reality theory, and fans of Westworld have found it to be particularly intriguing. Avatar The Last Airbender is a well-loved animated series that aired for the first time in 2005 and concluded with a television movie in 2008. Each of the three seasons is referred to as books, while each episode in that season is called a chapter. It tells the tale of four different nations living in a fantasy universe. Each nation has the ability to control one of the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air, but they're at war with each other each nation trying to establish dominion over the others. 
for the war to come to an end, an avatar needs to be born, and we meet this character in the form of a 12-year-old boy named Aang. He's able to control all four elements, but before he can do so, he needs to learn how to control fire, water, and earth, since his natural ability makes him an airbender. The series is set in a strange world filled with weird creatures and spectacular vistas. But some fans think that it may actually be set on Earth, only during a different time. Since the characters look exactly like humans, use fighting styles known to us, and encounter architecture very similar to ours, they believe it may be set in the far future. The theory suggests that most of the life forms on Earth have been wiped out by an apocalyptic event that not only erased our existence, but resulted in the characters of the show having no knowledge that we ever existed. If this mass extinction was caused by a nuclear event, it would also explain why the world is now filled with these strange animals that we've never encountered before, and why it has such a devastating global effect. The radiation left behind by this event may then have caused the new humans to develop strange abilities, which are evidenced by the bending powers that each of the nations possesses – air, fire, water, and earthbending. Others have suggested that the event didn't wipe out all life on Earth, but that a few humans somehow managed to survive. As the years passed, they lost all memory of the humans that used to live on the planet, and as radiation continued to affect the environment, animals underwent strange mutations, and humans started to develop powers that allowed them to manipulate the elements around them. Another theory states that humans were able to create powerful AI beings before they were destroyed, and that these are represented in the new world by the spirits that we see in the show. They consider themselves to be superior beings and look down on humans, since they remember the fact that we're responsible for our own demise. They also consider us as a threat, since there is always the chance that humans will fall back into their old habits, which is evidenced by the fact that there's already a global war going on at the start of the show. Some fans have gone as far as to theorize that the entire Avatar series is set in what we know as Asia and that the Fire Nation represents Japan, while the Earth Nation is meant to be living in China. Thanks to the strange nature of this show, it's been the subject of many different fan theories, some of which make more sense than others. But what is certain is that it's a show that will be remembered and rewatched for a very long time to come. The Great Reset is a call to action recovery initiative that was proposed by the World Economic Forum in 2020 after the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Its purpose was to start the rebuilding of societies that were affected by the pandemic with sustainable development firmly in mind. When the plan was announced, it was suggested that we would need three factors to rebuild these areas. These included green growth, smarter growth, and fairer growth, and many people were immediately on board since they could see the logic behind this kind of thinking. But shortly after the initiative saw the light of day, it fell victim to conspiracy theories as is often the case with anything that has to do with the government. And four years later, it's still a topic of discussion among those theorists. Many people were skeptical about this plan, since the World Economic Forum has been known to raise concerns over certain issues in the world, such as the ever-growing problem of global warming and poverty-stricken areas. But many people feel that it hasn't been proactive in fighting these issues, and rather relies on others to step in. Then there's the fact that it associates with the elite, which has caused many people to distrust the organization. And since a meeting is held in Davos, Switzerland every year in which only political leaders, celebrities, and the super wealthy are invited, it's become a fertile breeding ground for conspiracy theorists. Add to that the fact that this plan was announced in the very midst of a pandemic, and it's easy to see why this theory has gained so much traction over the past four years, and why it's still being discussed today. The conspiracy theory claims that this plan is merely a cover for the actual plan, which is to completely eradicate capitalism and to create a single world government that will rule everyone on Earth. Those who believe this to be true are certain that this process is already in motion and that we'll soon face with some very radical changes, such as having to give up our personal possessions, and that we'll all be forced to be vaccinated, and that the creation of digital identification cards points to something sinister that we aren't aware of. This theory started out on the internet when a few people started expressing their concerns, 
but soon it started snowballing, and before long, thousands of people had become convinced that we're being lied to, and that all governments of the world are attempting to pull wool over our eyes. This was only exacerbated when some well-known political figures started stating their belief in these theories, causing even more people to become convinced that we're headed for a dystopian future. The global lockdown that was imposed amidst the pandemic caused the theory to grow even further, since many people thought that it was just the beginning of the control that the one world government would eventually have over us. And while those lockdowns ended years ago, they're still being mentioned whenever the theory is discussed. Many of those who don't believe in this theory point to the fact that conspiracy theorists tend to believe that everything they see and read is somehow connected in a web of deceit, and that their claim has no basis in reality. In 2021, Daniel and Jason Freeman published a book called Overcoming Paranoid and Suspicious Thoughts, a self-help guide using cognitive behavioral techniques. And while doing research, they created a questionnaire that was circulated to members of the public. It contained questions such as, do you believe people are laughing at you? And do you believe someone is plotting against you? Surprisingly, they found that as many as 33% of people have these types of paranoid thoughts on a regular basis which would explain why so many conspiracy theories exist at any given time. One strange topic that's regularly spoken among conspiracy theorists is that they're possibly being followed by black helicopters, and they believe they belong to the CIA or another government entity. Brian Wilson, the news editor at The Star News, has revealed that he receives many calls every year from people who are convinced that they're being followed by these helicopters for reasons unknown. He often receives photos from some of these complaints, but these images are usually useless, since they're taken on cell phones and are unable to zoom in properly on an object that's high up in the sky. He recalls one particular instance when he received multiple calls from people, stating they saw a black helicopter flying overhead, and that it had a black net suspended underneath it. This immediately made them suspicious, and they wanted to find out what its purpose was. Despite being told that nothing sinister was going on, they insisted on coming up with a few of their own theories, many of which are so outlandish that it's hard to believe that someone would even consider them. One theory was that the net was being used to capture an unknown creature such as Bigfoot, after it was tracked down using the helicopter, and that the creature had been roaming around the area all along. Others believed that a secret underground research facility existed in the area, and that the helicopter was on the lookout to recapture one creature or another that had managed to escape somehow. Even when they were reassured that the helicopter wasn't in any way a part of a conspiracy, and that the net under the helicopter was merely a metal detector that was looking for mineral deposits in the area, many people refused to believe the explanation, and continued to speculate that the government was up to no good. As for the other black helicopters that were seen, they were carrying out inspections on energy transmission lines. Helicopters are used for this operation since the lines are suspended in the air, and hence they're more easily reached that way. But this is not the only instance where people have reported black helicopters as suspicious. Some people believe that these aircraft follow them around, but when asked why this would be, they're at a loss for an explanation. More level-headed people have pointed out that if someone was doing nothing wrong and has nothing to hide, the presence of these helicopters shouldn't be a concern. But the rumors have persisted for many years, and will likely do so for a very long time to come. Some commenters have stated that this misconception likely started thanks to movies and TV series in which black helicopters are used by villains and clandestine government groups, though this is just a theory. One can only wonder whether conspiracy theorists would have the same reaction to a helicopter that's painted any color other than black, or if this would just be seen as another helicopter with no nefarious intentions. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill, also known as the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, occurred on the 20th of April 2010, when disaster struck the Deepwater Horizon oil rig that was situated in the Gulf. An explosion was triggered, when a buildup of natural gas ignited and tore through a recently installed concrete structure that was meant to serve as a seal for an oil well that would have been used later on. The gas ignited once it traveled up one of the rig's risers, and it caused a massive amount of damage, including the loss of 11 lives. It was later revealed that the concrete structure had been constructed using nitrogen in the mix, which would have caused it to cure faster 
that also made it less effective against the massive pressures on the seabed. Mud was pumped into the riser to stop more gas and oil from reaching the surface. But when the rig eventually started listing and capsized two days later, oil started spilling out at a rate of about 60,000 barrels every day, and the gulf was badly affected. An investigation found that a failsafe device called a blowout preventer, which is supposed to stop oil from leaking out, had failed. Attempts were then made to cover the oil well with a containment dome, but this also failed, and oil continued to leak into the ocean. The next plan to pump mud into the hole also had no effect, and eventually a cap was placed over the well, and this stemmed the flow of oil somewhat, although nearly 5 million barrels of oil had already escaped by this point. Ultimately, concrete was pumped into the well, and it was finally completely sealed up. But the amount of pollution that resulted was staggering. The oil slick stretched over an area of 57,500 square miles, and the cleanup effort would only come to an end in 2014, four years after the disaster occurred. But while all of this was happening, conspiracy theorists were having a field day. They suggested that the explosion was by no means an accident, and that the entire incident had been orchestrated. They claimed that this was evidenced by the fact that an oil field services company called Halley Burton had just bought an oil rig fire and blowout containment company weeks before the explosion occurred, and that they would have made massive profits from the disaster. They also claimed that many people knew of the disaster before it occurred, since many investors sold their BP stock shares in the weeks before the explosion happened. One conspiracy theorist named Greg Evanson speculated that as many as 40 million people would be evacuated from the surrounding areas by the government, since the air had become saturated with toxic chemicals used in the cleanup effort, which simply wasn't the case. He also claimed that some people would be enforcing these evacuations, and they weren't actually from the US military, but some kind of human-alien hybrid species. Others claimed that while the explosion definitely took place, there was no oil spill, and the military personnel and cleanup crews were actually in the area for some other sinister reason that was only known by a select few. The truth of the matter is that the oil spill was widely reported on by news outlets from around the world for years after the initial incident, and thousands of people witnessed the cleanup operations. But this did little to stem the steady flow of misinformation from conspiracy theorists. Harold Holt was the leader of the Liberal Party and the 17th President of Australia, who served in that role for just one year from 1966 to 1967. He's known as the President who took Australia out of the sterling era, which is a time when the country still used sterling silver as its currency. Away from his political career, he was known to have a great passion for the ocean, and he owned properties in Port C, Queensland, Victoria, and he used to enjoy spearfishing. On the 17th of December, 1967, Holt and a few of his friends were spending a weekend at his Port Sea property when they heard that sailor Alec Rose would be passing by Point Nepean whilst attempting to circumnavigate the globe on his own, and the group decided to go to the area to see if they could spot him. Once they were done at Point Nepean, they headed back to Port Sea to have lunch, but Holt decided that he wanted to go for a swim in a remote area called Cheviot Beach, since he'd spearfished there many times before and told his friends that he knew the area extremely well. Hence, they made the detour, but upon their arrival there, they realized that the sea had become very rough, and most declined to enter the water, except for Holt and one of his friends, Alan Stewart. Stewart likely realized how dangerous the water could become, and so decided to stay as close to the beach as he possibly could. But Holt decided to swim out further, and soon he found that he was in trouble. His friends stated that he seemed to get caught up in a rip current, and despite struggling against it for a while, he lost the battle and eventually disappeared beneath the waves, never to be seen again. The search effort that followed is still hailed as one of the largest in the country's history. But despite this, Holt was never found, and the search had to eventually be called off. Holt was declared deceased on the 18th of December, with the official cause of his passing being ruled as an accidental drowning. It was a tragic event in Australia's history, but some conspiracy theorists are adamant that the facts reported in the news were merely a ruse to distract people from the reality of the situation, that Holt was still alive after faking his own passing. Some people felt so strongly about this theory that they started contacting the police to air their suspicions. 
Making matters worse was a letter written by an American lawyer in which he stated his belief that Holt met his end thanks to carefully orchestrated sabotage, likely by a group from a different country. It was speculated that he'd unknowingly ingested delayed effect medication that could have been placed in his food or drink while he was on his way to the beach. This would have left him helpless once he'd swum out and eventually would have caused him to falter in the waves. Others believe that once he was underwater, he was picked up by a submarine and eventually brainwashed into revealing certain government secrets. But due to the extremely rough conditions, it would have been all but impossible to operate a submarine in the area that day. There's even been speculation that he disappeared of his own free will and that he's living a new life somewhere else. But none of these theories have ever been proven. George Soros is a well-known Hungarian-American billionaire, philanthropist, and businessman with a net worth of around $6.7 billion. He founded the Central European University, which is situated in Budapest, where studies concerning social sciences are carried out. During the Second World War, he and his family managed to survive by hiding the fact that they were Jewish. They managed to secure false identity documents and also helped other Jewish families escape the horrors of that war. Following the end of the war, he relocated to London in 1947, where he worked as a railway porter and a nightclub waiter while studying at the London School of Economics. He eventually moved to the US in 1956, and 20 years later, he'd become one of the country's most successful investors ever. He's known to be a firm supporter of the LGBTQ community as he continues to promote the principle of an open society. And he stated that his financial success has allowed him to attempt to create a more equal and just world for everyone. But not everyone is convinced that Soros has the good intentions that he claims to. He's been the subject of numerous conspiracy theories, some of which paint him as a man who only has his own interests at heart. One such theory came about after an article was posted to the conservative political journalism website called The Free Beacon specifically regarding his donor network, Democracy Donors, and his activities within that network. Further conspiracies have popped up in recent times with the emergence of the QAnon conspiracy theory, which claims that the world will soon be overtaken by a group of elites who worship Satan and who are attempting to control the media as well as the world's politics. One poll conducted in 2020 revealed that as many as 17% of Americans believe this theory, and by all accounts, this number seems to be growing, as some politicians and prominent figures have revealed that they're a part of the QAnon movement. Those who subscribe to this theory believe that political leaders such as Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, and George Soros are part of the elitist group that will eventually take over the world. They also include certain celebrities in this list, including Tom Hanks, Oprah Winfrey, and Ellen DeGeneres, and even Pope Francis and the Dalai Lama have been named as part of this massive conspiracy. They further allege that the leaders of this group will soon be exposed, arrested, and forced to serve time in prison at Guantanamo Bay, but they've also stated that many of these members will eventually be executed. Other rumors surrounding Soros claim that he sympathized with German forces during the Second World War, despite proof existing that the exact opposite is true. He's also accused of sponsoring certain protests and supporting coups in some countries, including Russia. But again, these allegations are made without any evidence. In a bid to stem the flow of theories and harassment, a group of fact checkers were tasked with either confirming or debunking these claims. But they then became the targets of conspiracy theorists and did their utmost to discredit the findings that Soros isn't some part of some global organization that seeks to take over the world. These fact checkers were able to disprove the wild theories suggested by conspiracists, but still the rumors persist. And since it's almost impossible to change the mind of a conspiracy theorist, the chances are these won't be the last allegations made against him. Most of us are aware that there's fluoride in our toothpaste and that it helps keep our teeth strong by strengthening the hard enamel surface that's exposed to food we eat and the drinks we ingest. But fluoride can also be harmful but only if it's ingested in large amounts. This usually results in a white streaky buildup on the teeth. And the leading cause of this is when someone swallows their toothpaste while brushing their teeth rather than washing it down the drain. Used correctly, fluoride has many dental health benefits, but in recent times, it's become the focus of a conspiracy theory. 
And as outlandish as this may sound, millions of people around the world believe that it's part of a nefarious plot. It all started in 1901 when a dentist named Frederick McKay noticed that some of his patients had strange stains on their teeth, and he made it his mission to find out what was causing it. He eventually discovered that the likely cause was the water supply. In 1931, dentist H. V. Churchill suggested that this staining was being caused by aluminum that was present in the water, since he found several cases of staining in an area near aluminum mines. He then performed tests in several different areas and came to the realization that communities that had fluoride in their water saw much fewer incidents of staining and tooth decay. This prompted the U.S. Public Health Service to conduct their own studies in 1942, with the help of dentist Dr. H.T. Dean, who was able to confirm that naturally occurring fluoride had a positive effect in areas where it was present in the water supply. This prompted the U.S. government to start adding fluoride to water supplies in areas where it wasn't naturally occurring, the first being Grand Rapids, Michigan, and six years later, it was found that tooth decay in children living in Grand Rapids was 50% less than those in surrounding communities. Over the next few years, fluoride was added to the water supply of several other towns and cities, and soon it became apparent that it was having a positive effect. Soon, the initiative was adopted in other countries, including the Netherlands, Canada, and New Zealand, and the same results were reported. It was then implemented in some areas in England and Ireland, and today, as many as 40 countries have fluoride in their water, helping people fight tooth decay. But conspiracy theorists believe that this is just another way for the governments of the world to control us. Despite over 3,000 different studies being conducted around the world, and all these reports showing that the most adverse effect of fluoridation was slight staining of the enamel, some people remain adamant that it's causing harm. One conspiracy theory holds that fluoride is being used to brainwash members of the public, or that it somehow makes us more suggestible and hence easier to control. Others have stated that it causes acne, and it's one of the leading causes of Alzheimer's disease, as well as anemia, which is a shortage of hemoglobin. Then there's the theory that areas where fluoridation has been implemented have seen a dramatic drop in people's IQs, just another way that these governments are supposedly keeping us under their thumbs. While this may sound like a strange belief to most of us, there are thousands of people who believe in the theory which is evidenced by the fact that 74 different cities have decided to stop fluoridating their water supply. A perpetual motion machine is a device that would change the world forever, since it could be used to create an endless supply of electricity, which could then be used to power households, businesses, electric vehicles, and just about any electric device known to man. But such a device remains elusive. Many scientists have attempted to construct a perpetual motion machine, but the reality is that the gravity works against them, and the only way to keep a device in perpetual motion is to add a power supply, which defeats the entire point of its purpose. Furthermore, an endless supply of energy would mean that electricity would eventually become a free commodity, and because of this, conspiracy theorists believe that such a device may already exist, but that it's being kept from the public so that they keep paying their power bills. But the theory, known as free energy suppression, doesn't focus solely on perpetual motion devices, but also alternative methods of generating electricity that usually involve large oil companies. These theorists have claimed that much cheaper and safer methods of electricity production have existed for a long time, but that oil and power companies would lose an immeasurable amount of profit if these methods were to be implemented in our daily lives. But the theory doesn't end there. It's also been suggested that the governments of the world and certain lobby groups have started weakening renewable energy sources such as biofuel, solar panels, and geothermal devices to force us to use petroleum, diesel, and nuclear-generated electricity instead. The first and probably most popular theory regarding free energy suppression is that it would cause capitalism to completely collapse, since the public wouldn't have to pay for many of the commodities that they're being charged for at present. Then there's the emergence of electric cars. Since free electricity would completely wipe out the need for gasoline and diesel-powered cars in favor of electric vehicles, conspiracy theorists claim that oil companies would be decimated and hence will not allow this technology to become common knowledge. One man, Stanley Meyer, once stated that he'd invented a way for cars to operate using nothing more than water, 
but he added that before he could reveal his discovery, he was targeted by what he refers to as dark forces, and he eventually passed away without divulging his secret. Another man, Bob Boyce, also claims to have invented a similar type of water-based fuel, but it's said that he was secretly given cancer-causing agents via a microchip that was implanted in his body, and his method was also never revealed. The theory further claims that we're being forced to use incandescent light bulbs that only last for around a thousand hours, when bulbs exist that can last as long as 150,000 hours. But it's been pointed out that these bulbs, if they exist, would require a lot more electricity and hence wouldn't be any more cost effective. Furthermore, it's said that certain sectors of industry are suppressing the use of the hemp plant to replace cotton, oil, fossil fuels, plastics, and certain building materials, since it's much cheaper to use and would cause many billions of dollars in losses. While it is true that hemp is a very versatile plant that's being used in many different ways, there's no evidence to prove that its use is being suppressed by anyone, least of all massive corporations that would come under fire if it was discovered that they were discouraging the use of more sustainable and cost-effective materials. American football is arguably the USA's most popular sport, followed closely by basketball and what many consider to be America's favorite pastime, baseball. Proving just how popular the sport has become, it was estimated that as many as 123 million people watched the Super Bowl in 2024 in America alone, and it still holds the achievement of being the most watched TV program in the country's history. The Dallas Cowboys have the most impressive record when it comes to American football, as they boast an impressive 57.6 winning percentage. But when it comes to the Super Bowl, the Pittsburgh Steelers and New England Patriots sit at the top of the ranks with six wins each. When it comes to the best quarterback of all time, many will agree that this accolade belongs to Tom Brady, who spent 20 years of his career with the New England Patriots, a team that's often mentioned in conspiracy theories. These theories likely stemmed from the team's success, since many people feel that the referees who oversee their games, the league office, and even media outlets are part of a rigging system that's geared towards ensuring victory for the team. One way that this is said to be done is that officials decline to call blatant penalties committed by the Patriots, and this of course results in the team winning more games. But this part of the conspiracy goes much deeper. It's been suggested that the league office chooses the specific referees for each Patriot game, and then sends orders to those refs on how the game is supposed to play out. This, according to some, is known to the media, but since they receive better ratings when the Patriots win, they choose to turn a blind eye. While these theories have been around for a long time, they became even more outlandish in 2022, after the Patriots defeated the Jacksonville Jaguars 50-10 securing a postseason berth in the process. When the game ended, one of the referees was seen walking up to Brady and shaking his hand, causing conspiracy theorists to speculate that the referee was part of a scheme to secure Patriots' victory. Adding fuel to this conspiracy fire was the fact that the Patriots were only called for one penalty during the entire game, which caused them to lose just 10 yards. One would think that these theories wouldn't have much of an impact, but some league and team officials have stated that they've started affecting the Patriot team's popularity, though this is yet to be proven. But the best-remembered conspiracy theory regarding the New England Patriots is one known as Deflategate, in which it was speculated that the team underinflated the footballs used during the 2014 AFC Championship game against the Indianapolis Colts by as much as two pounds, making them easier to handle, throw, and receive. It's said that Tom Brady preferred the grip that he got on softer balls, and since this was an important game, ordered the balls be deflated so that the team could have an advantage over the opposing quarterback. An investigation was launched by the NFL, and it was eventually found that the rumors were likely untrue, though the team was ordered to pay a $1 million fine, and Brady was suspended for four games. None of these conspiracy theories have been proven to be true, and yet they're still spoken about often today. And since it involves one of America's most popular sports, they'll be discussed for many years to come. In the world of conspiracy theories, chemtrails are among the most often mentioned. Hundreds of websites claim to have information on this theory. And over the years, more and more people have become convinced that this is a conspiracy that's taking place in the skies above their heads. 
To understand chemtrails, one first needs to understand contrails or condensation trails. These are the white trails that are left behind when an airplane flies overhead, and they're caused by vapor that freezes or condenses around an airplane's exhaust. Most of us would have seen these lines in the sky, and while many of us think they're quite beautiful, conspiracy theorists believe they hold a dark secret that's only known by a select few, most notably the governments of the world. The idea of chemtrails started back in 1996, when a research paper from someone in the Air Force emerged. It was entitled Weather as a Force Multiplier, Owning the Weather in 2025, and it immediately sent conspiracy theorists' tongues wagging. The paper suggested that a weather modification system could be used by the year 2025, and that this would allow the military to reach some of its objectives with the use of aerospace forces. It further stated that this type of system didn't exist at the time, but that it would be of great use if ever developed. This gave birth to the suggestion that what we see as beautiful streaks in the sky are actually highly toxic chemicals that are being released into the Earth's atmosphere by the government or the world elite, and that this is being done for some nefarious reason. Some believe that these chemtrails are being used to control the minds of the public, making them more suggestible and hence easier to control. They claim that this would be useful to any government, since they would then be free to pass any laws they deemed fit and would encounter very little resistance. Others think that the trails are simply toxic and that they're being used to poison people on the ground, though why this would be done is yet to be explained, since there's no reason for any government to simply poison its own people. Then there's the theory that this is some kind of weather controlling method, as was suggested by the Air Force research paper. While some think this could be done for positive reasons, such as diverting damaging storms, others feel that it could be used to create such damaging conditions during wartime, giving the controlling side a marked advantage. The theory gained further traction in 2021, when Texas experienced a week of cold weather that was called the Deep Freeze. Some social media users started suggesting that this was the work of the American government, and quite unbelievably, a poll found that up to 10% of the population agreed with this suggestion, with at least as many as 30% of Americans believing that it was at least possible. But scientists have conducted numerous studies to prove or disprove the theory, and they found no evidence of any foreign chemicals being present in contrails. Furthermore, many people have pointed out for this scheme to ever work, too many people would have to be made aware of it, and hence it would never remain a secret. And yet the theory persists and has become more prevalent today than it ever has before, despite there being no proof whatsoever that we're being poisoned or controlled by chemicals that are being released into our air. On the 13th of May, 1917, three shepherd children, Francisco and Jacinta Marto and Lucia dos Santos, were tending to their sheep in Cova da Iria in Fatima, Portugal and later returned home to report that they'd seen something very unusual while out in the fields. They stated that they'd been approached by a woman who was surrounded by a bright light that shone as bright as the sun, and after introducing herself as the Lady of the Rosary, she asked them to pray to the Rosary for peace on earth. They would report seeing the same apparition a further five times over the next few months, and each time the Lady had a message to share, and these have become known as the Three Secrets of Fatima. These secrets were only known to Lucia, since she recorded them in a set of memoirs and only revealed the first two in the 1940s. She decided to keep the third secret to herself, and many people believe that this is because it would be too horrific to share. The first of the secrets revealed to the children was a vision of hell that follows the same narrative that's given in the Bible, with souls being tormented in a sea of fire and never-ending dismay. The second secret was revealed to be a prediction of the end of the First World War, but it also warned that it would be followed by another great war, which most people believe was the Second World War. This secret also stated that the people of Russia should convert to Catholicism. The third secret remained with Lucia, but she was asked by the Bishop of Laria to write it down and she agreed. Once it was written down, the secret was sealed away from prying eyes, and it would remain hidden for decades until it was finally unsealed in 2000. This was done on the very day that Francisco and Jacinta were beatified, and the world waited with bated breath to hear the message that they'd speculated over for such a long time. Many people feared that it would reveal something terrible that would happen in the future, and if the secrets are to be believed, they were correct. 
The message stated that Christians would face persecution in the future, and it made specific mention of a bishop that would be dressed in white and who would suffer some kind of attack. This is believed to refer to the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II, which took place in 1981. The secret had finally been revealed, and while this set many people's minds at ease since all three events had already taken place, others remained skeptical since they believed that the third secret was still being kept from them or that, at the very least, some of the document had not been revealed. It's believed that this conspiracy theory came to be thanks to the tame nature of the third secret. Since so many people believed that it contained a message so dire that several popes refused to divulge it, conspiracy theorists claim that the mention of the bishop in white clothing is just a fragment of the message, and that it actually contains horrors that we couldn't possibly fathom. But the Catholic Church hit back at these allegations, by stating that the very reason that the secret was revealed was to stop the spread of misinformation, speculation, and conspiracy theories. But it will, however, take a lot more to convince these theorists that the mystery of the third secret has truly been revealed in its entirety. In 1919, the Chicago White Sox were considered to be the best team in all of baseball, making it all the way to the World Series. It's understandable then that when the Cincinnati Reds defeated them by five games to three, some people smelled a rat and conspiracy theories abounded. And those theories turned out to be true when pitcher Eddie Sicat confessed to a grand jury that he was part of a matchmaking scheme, along with seven other White Sox players, to throw the World Series in the favor of the Reds. The players involved were pitcher Eddie Sicat. Claude Williams, first baseman Arnold Gandal, shortstop Charles Risberg, third baseman George Weaver, outfielders Joe Jackson and Oscar Felsch, as well as the utility infielder Fred McMullen. The scheme saw these players receiving large amounts of money from a gambling syndicate run by Arnold Rothstein. Since the Sox's club owner, Charles Comiskey, was known to underpay his players, they saw it as an opportunity for a proper payday in a scheme masterminded by Chick Gandal, who'd previously been arrested for stealing money from the Fresno team, of which he had previously been a member. Immediately after the series ended, Hugh Fullerton and other sports writers aired their suspicions, but it wasn't until September of the following year that a grand jury was called to investigate. After more players confessed, Comiskey suspended the seven remaining players, since Gandal was already suspended due to a salary dispute. The players stood trial the following year, but their confessions and other key evidence had disappeared from the grand jury files, and they were acquitted. On the 3rd of August of that year, all eight players involved were suspended from baseball for life. Seven of the players received $5,000 each for their part in the fix, equivalent to about $75,000 today. But Gandal received much more for being the mastermind, pocketing $35,000, the equivalent of about $520,000 today. The White Sox, having lost seven of their best players, slid to seventh place in 1921 and would only feature in a pennant race again 16 years after the scandal took place. In 1972, many conspiracy theorists believed that John Lennon, the legendary rhythm guitarist for the Beatles, was being watched by the FBI. Not only did this conspiracy theory turn out to be true, but it went much deeper than previously speculated. Since 1972 was an election year, the Nixon administration believed that Lenin's stance on the war, as well as his other political beliefs, posed a threat to the country's 18 to 29 year olds voting direction, given his popularity with people of that age. A federal agent was quoted as saying that if Lenin and Yoko Ono dared to attend the Republican National Convention in Miami of that year, the couple would be arrested for interstate travel in the furtherance of conspiracy to incite a riot. A lawyer named Leon Wilds wrote that he had never seen the government so determined to have someone removed from the United States. Wilds would go on to publish a book on how hard the Nixon administration fought to have Lenin deported back to the UK, 
with its efforts hinging mostly on a prior conviction for possession of an illegal substance in the UK in 1968. After being arrested on that charge, Lennon and Ono moved to the US on temporary visas and were actively participating in demonstrations such as the rally to have MC5 band manager John Sinclair released from prison after he was arrested for selling illegal substances to an undercover police officer. 15,000 people attended that rally and Lennon performed the song John Sinclair which he'd written especially for that occasion causing the government to take an even closer look into him since Sinclair was released by the following weekend after serving two years behind bars. When the government learned that a group called the Chicago 7 was planning to recruit people to attend the Republican National Convention by holding rock concerts with Lennon as a drawing card, US Attorney General John Mitchell had Lennon's visa revoked and set in motion processes to have him deported. He would be granted a one-month extension on his visa, but the government had decided to make the couple's life as hard as possible. Telephone repair men were sent to their house but left when asked for identification. Two men were spotted across the road from Lennon's house fixing a bike for days on end and when the couple got into a vehicle, the same two men followed them in their own car. It got to the point where Lennon would speak in a woman's voice whenever he contacted his attorney by phone and this would go on for the next four years. But at the end of those four years, Lennon was granted permanent resident status in the US thanks to a technicality in his previous conviction and by that time, Nixon had already left office. Lennon would later state that during the years that he was being pursued, he was made to feel perfectly at home by the people of New York and he would live there until passing away in 1980 at the hands of Mark Chapman. The true story of Operation Mockingbird was speculated about by conspiracy theorists during the 1970s, claiming that the CIA was manipulating news media for the purpose of propaganda towards the people of the United States. In 1967, an article published in Ramparts magazine exposed the CIA's support of front groups. It reported that the National Student Association was receiving funds from the agency and in 1975, a congressional investigation by the church committee found that the CIA had connections to as many as 50 journalists as well as civic groups. In 1973, the CIA published a document entitled The Family Jewels in which they referenced a different operation called Project Mockingbird. The document detailed how journalists were wiretapped and eavesdropped on in order to identify leaks within the US government. An article published in Rolling Stone magazine in 1977 added further info on the church committee's findings, stating that around 400 members of the press were considered by the CIA to be intelligence assets. This included Arthur Hayes Sulzberg, publisher of the New York Times as well as Time Magazine. Reporter Deborah Davis wrote that Operation Mockingbird was established by Frank Wisner, the director of the Office of Policy Coordination. She stated that this was done in retaliation to reports that the International Organization of Journalists was receiving money from Moscow to control journalists from every major newspaper in Europe in order to disseminate stories in favor of the communist cause. She went on to claim that by the 1950s, Wisner controlled members of the New York Times, Newsweek, and CBS and that after Cord Meyer joined the CIA, he became the main operative for Operation Mockingbird. On the 17th of January, 1920, the Volstead Act was introduced in the United States. The act was named after Judiciary Chairman Andrew Volstead and it was aimed at implementing the Prohibition Amendment by defining the processes and procedures for banning alcoholic beverages, their production, as well as their distribution. And so for the next 13 years, it would be illegal to produce or sell alcoholic drinks, with the exception of cider and wine which can be made at home. Distilleries in the bordering Canada and Mexico flourished during this time as people would either travel there to get a drink 
or smuggle alcohol back to their homes, as it wasn't illegal to consume stockpiled beverages. Much of the smuggled alcohol became available for sale at hidden bars and nightclubs, known as speakeasies. They were named so because patrons had to whisper in low tones when attempting to enter one of these establishments. Since grape juice was legal to drink, its sales skyrocketed as it would ferment and turn into wine if left to stand for 60 days or more. Vine Glow, a grape concentrate, was sold for this purpose and included instructions on how to turn the juice into wine. This would only last until 1931, however, after a federal court ruling found that it violated Section 29 of the Volstead Act. Bootleggers began using industrial ethyl alcohol to produce illegal beverages. But when many people started getting sick, and in many cases losing their lives after consuming alcohol produced this way, conspiracy theories arose claiming that the government was poisoning the supply of ethyl alcohol to prevent further production of alcohol. Many people believed that this was merely speculation, but it soon came to light that the conspiracy theorists were correct, as it was found the government ordered methyl alcohol to be added to ethyl alcohol supplies. This did not deter everyone, however, and many people still consumed the illegally made drinks. Before the prohibition officially ended in 1933, as many as 10,000 people lost their lives as a result. On April 14, 1865, Abraham Lincoln became the first United States president to be assassinated. He was attending a play called Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., when he was attacked by stage actor and Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln would pass away the next day in the Peterson House across the street from the theater at 7.22 a.m. But many conspiracy theories held that Booth didn't act alone, and he was part of a much larger conspiracy, a speculation that turned out to be completely accurate. On April 14th, Booth had visited the theater to pick up his mail when he learned that Lincoln planned on attending the play that night. This gave him the perfect opportunity to carry out his plan, as he had been on stage at Ford's Theater many times and knew the layout of the building and its staff well. He and his fellow conspirators, Lewis Powell, Michael O'Laughlin, Samuel Arnold, and John Surratt had conspired to kidnap Lincoln on the 17th of March as he returned from the play at the Campbell Military Hospital. But he had attended a ceremony at the National Hotel instead, and their plan was thwarted. Other fellow conspirators included David Harold, a dim-witted man who helped Booth escape to Virginia, George Adserat, who was given the task to assassinate Vice President Andrew Johnson, but backed out. Mary Surratt, who owned the boarding house where the conspirators met. Samuel Mudd, who set Booth's broken leg after the attack, and Edmund Spangler, a stagehand at the theater who assisted Booth that night. Upon learning that Lincoln would be at the theater, Booth traveled to the boarding house and asked Mary Surratt to tell a tenant, Louis Weichman, to ready the weapons that he had stored there earlier. The group met one final time that night at 8.45 p.m., and knowing that he would be able to gain access to the president's box due to being a known actor, Booth decided that he would carry out the attack. He planned to fire at Lincoln first before attacking Ulysses S. Grant with a sharpened blade, not knowing that Grant had decided not to accompany Lincoln as the men's wives weren't fond of each other. The policeman, tasked with guarding the presidential box, John Parker, took his chance to visit a tavern during the intermission along with Lincoln's valet. This just happened to be the same tavern where Booth was sitting in wait to carry out the group's heinous plan. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.